Hey students, so it's been a little while since I recorded one of these for you, but I hope you will find it helpful as a change from our usually having it in class. So what I'm gonna be covering in today's lecture is uh, primarily, I just wanna review some of the key points from the Upstone reading on Freud. And uh, maybe I'll talk a little bit about the Morning and Melancholia essay that you'll also be reading this week. But let's start with the Upstone. And I'm gonna actually just kind of go through um, step-by-step step some of the, um, what hopefully you've already read in the chapter. So and kind of follow along. Uh, one of the main points that she makes that I think is, is key is that unlike basically all the other approaches that they cover in this book for um, literary analysis, psychoanalysis is also a real world practical field of study designed to treat mental health difficulties. So it's interesting, I think, that literary criticism has kind of taken this field and applied it uh, especially given that psychoanalysis is of course a ongoing developing field and earlier psychoanalytic theories have become discredited as we come to a better understanding of how the mind works. That said, I think it's very tempting when people are starting to look at Freud and literary criticism to dismiss him because it's, it's really easy if you're coming with a feminist analysis, for example, to say, well, much of what he says is possibly nonsense. I, I wouldn't, I might not go that far, but maybe I would. Um, he did not necessarily apply a lot of scientific rigor to his theories and they have, many of them have been pretty discredited. You can kind of put that aside though, because we are not approaching this as psychologists, right? We are not, um, looking for the accuracy of how Freud thought about sexuality or so on as we're doing this, what we're interested in is just the, the concept of starting to think about um, how the mind functions and how you might apply that to literary theory. Um, so if you are reading along and you are not buying into Freud's concepts of women or whatever else, that's fine, but it's not a reason to just completely dismiss psychoanalytic theory. So that's the first thing that I wanna just sort of emphasize out of this. Um, I think one of the main key elements of psychoanalytic theory is that you know Freud believed that forces in our unconscious drive us to behave in certain ways. We're unaware of these feelings, but they direct how we feel and act, right? So when you are thinking, for example, about a literary character and text and you are uh, trying to sort of make a determination about, you know, what's motivating the character here, uh, what is the author trying to do, you're probably already doing this where you are thinking not just about what the character consciously says that they want or knows that they want, but what other aspects of their background and their thought process might be also driving their thinking, their actions, et cetera, right? So I, I think, I'm guessing that you already have integrated much of this into the way you read texts. Um, so if so, you're getting that from Freud. Um, he divides things into the ego, the superego, and the id. It's sort of useful to have those definitions. Um, ego is your conscious self. Superego is the modifier of the id's desires, the moral self, and the id is one's instincts, right? So what's, you know, the kind of like back of the brain, something's coming at me, is it a monster, is it sexy? The id's gonna be responding to that. Um, a lot of the id's impulses for Freud are sexual, libido, the desire, and he calls this drive the Eros drive and away from the desire for death, which is the Thanatos drive. And then he gets very into this male power being related to sexual desire. And Freud gave us this concept of the phallus, um, penis is symbol of the masculine drive to dominate and control. So um, I do not necessarily buy into a lot of this, but perhaps you do. So, um, okay. It's probably useful to know about the Oedipus complex um, just because 
it's it's a big piece of psychoanalytic theory. Um, the play, Oedipus Rex, excellent play, the whole Oedipus cycle, I strongly recommend should you feel like reading some Greek tragedy. Um, but Freud takes that play and he uses the main character to talk about the Oedipus complex and he has a whole sort of sequence that the male child is supposed to go through is as infant development. Um, so there's a little bit of analysis here of that. There's a lot of criticism of this. So, and which Upstone notes, right? So from the feminist, the post-colonial, the post-structuralist, et cetera, there are um, many, many, many issues. And I, one I wanna highlight, right, is that Deleuze and Guattari are arguing that the Freudian preoccupation with Oedipus reduces everything to myth, which really limits the possible readings of the self, right? So, and then the consequences of that are furthering of patriarchal ideologies, racism, furtherance of capitalist hegemony. There's, they would say there's some very negative real world consequences to buying into this sort of theory. Okay, so that's something you should be aware of. And then feminist critics, I'm guessing you've heard this, have also argued against Freud's theories of female desire, in particular suggestion that women are driven by their lack of the symbols of male power, which he calls penis envy. So there are lots of feminists, including Kate Millett in Sexual Politics, who um, says Freud, not only does he get it completely wrong, but uh, his work ends up supporting the patriarchy and making it harder for women to achieve equality or you know a decent pay rate or whatever else um okay so that's that's sort of some some highlights of freud um the chapter goes on to talk about young he talks about the electric con complex which i'm uh, another thing you may or may not buy into um but i think one of the things that's more interesting um well, actually, there are a couple things that are more interesting. Um, as, as she goes on in the chapter, she refers to, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this right, but Freud's idea of the unheimlich uh, from the German. And that's something that I think is very useful to literary theory. This word um, translates as unhomely. It's a sensation of something unsettling and yet familiar, that which reminds us of home but troubles us. And I think that's one of the things that you could apply to surrealism, you can apply it to science fiction, and it can become a very useful lens for looking at literature. One of the terms we use in science fiction criticism is cognitive estrangement. And that's um, when you write a text or you're reading a text and it often will have some element that is a little bit different from us, from the everyday, and that can create a, it creates possibilities of being able to talk about things um, through that estrangement that uh, would be hard to see in a strictly realist representation. Um, so that's, that's one example of how you can use this Freudian concept that might be interesting to you guys. Um, he, they talk about deja vu in this chapter. Another thing you might think about is something like the uncanny valley, which is, you know, you'll see this sometimes in when people are talking about robots or they're talking about um, things that, that seem almost human, but not quite. There's something a little bit off and it's unnerving to us. So um, this, uh, this uncanny sense can be, as they say here, simultaneously intimate and disturbing. Um, and now Freud will have a whole theory about how this is connected to the id, et cetera, which again, you may not, or may or may not buy into, but, and, and he says it's because you've denied something or repressed something. Um, but I think what's interesting to me is whether you think you've denied or repressed something or not, that, there is this, there is this experience, a shared experience. I think most people have had a moment of deja vu and it's unnerving, right? That in the sense that we're always on the edge of something threatening or disturbing. And then when you look at someone like Poe and read him through that lens, um, uh, or really any of the like 19th century Gothic literature romances, for example, um, 
this could be a useful way to talk about those, to think about them and talk about those. Okay. Um, uh, so anyway, they go into, Upstone goes into this in more detail with Henry James, um, sexual imagery of that novel, um, et cetera. He, she also talks about Freud's idea of the double. I don't want to spend a lot of time on each of these details, but you may find this interesting. Um, and then when you go to Jung, to flip back to his contemporary Jung, Jung is less focused on the individual and more on groups and communities. Um, so from Jung, we get the idea of the collective unconscious, ideas and impulses inherited from our ancestors. Um, and, and one of the things I particularly like about Jung is he developed the term of archetypes. And that's something that as a, as a writer, certainly, I draw on quite a lot. If I am writing fantasy, I am thinking about the hero, I'm thinking about the wizard, I'm thinking about the, um, the great evil, um, et cetera, and using those to uh, work with these myths and images that Jung would say reside in our unconscious, that are inherited and shape our understanding of the world. They're very powerful, I think. So, and when you think about archetypes versus stereotypes, one way to think about it is that archetypes are larger than life. Stereotypes are a reduction, right? They make people less than human. So I think hopefully that's a helpful distinction. Um, so she goes into this a little more. Then it gets into Lacanian psychoanalysis. And Lacan is where... <laughs> where the lit theorists get super excited about psychoanalysis essentially, because he takes psychoanalysis, but he in fact really directly connects it to the structuralists, structuralists and to the semioticians who are looking at the sign and signifier um, elements. So I don't wanna spend a ton of time on Lacan because, um, you know, some of what he gets into with the mirror stage and child development, you know, really has been, you know, questioned at the very least, if not discredited, right? So you may not take all of that necessarily seriously, but he does give us sort of models for how you can use psychoanalytical theory in a way that, um, that, that ties it explicitly to structuralism and to semiotics. So if that's the area of lit crit that interests you, then perhaps Lacan is the person for you. Um, there's, there's a whole set of um, people who are Lacanian followers basically. Um, and so if, you're, if you find that appealing, there's a lot more that you could read along those lines. Okay, I think that <laughs> this is kind of already a long video. Um, I don't want to go on too long. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, I don't want to skip over Julia Kristeva. Um, but maybe we'll get to that in class, actually. I think you, you probably don't need to do that before we... Yeah. So let's, let's actually save Kristeva and the melancholia and mourning for class discussion on Wednesday. Um, but what I would like you to do as you're doing your reading be sure that you can, um, that you understand the distinction that Freud is making between melancholia and mourning. Because I think that will be helpful for us to talk about. So that's in the essay that you're reading for Wednesday. And then for Friday, we're going to um, talk about some of the ideas and in interpretation of dreams, which is a long text and I'm not gonna have you read, but I do wanna give it to you. And so, <coughs> one thing I'm going to ask you to do this week is keep a dream journal. And so um, today I'm recording this on Sunday. You probably won't actually watch the video till Monday, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So ideally try to do four entries in a dream journal. Just jot down when you wake up, whatever you might remember of your dreams, right? Um, which might be nothing. You might wake up and not remember anything, but uh, try to keep a record for four days and we'll discuss that on Friday and sort of some of what Freud talks about in regards to dreams, which I think can then connect in interesting ways to lit. So that's it for the lecture. Um,
I look forward to seeing you all on Wednesday. Good luck with the reading. Uh, I hope that you, I tried to give you light reading this week because I know you all just finished a paper and handed it in. Uh, I will be, it'll, it usually takes me two weeks to read and grade the paper. So don't expect them back sooner, although you never know. All right. Thanks everybody. Enjoy President's Day and I will see you all on Wednesday. Bye.